Uh, this evening, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Norman Gall, the Executive Director of the Fernand Braudel Institute of World Economics in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, for a talk titled Oil, Euphoria, and uh, Brazil's Future, the Politics of Potential and Limitation. Uh, a bit of background, uh, in 2006, uh, a massive new deep water oil field uh, was discovered some 160 miles off Brazil's coast. Uh, formerly known as the Tupi oil fields, uh, but commonly referred to as Presal or the Presalt oil fields. The discovery is believed to be the largest oil field uh, discovered in the Western Hemisphere in the past three decades. And the discovery comes at a pol politically opportune moment uh, in Brazilian history. It coincides with rapid economic growth and uh, significant demogra demographic shifts. Uh, in January of 2011, uh, Brazil's governmental energy research company published its report on uh, Brazilian energy consumption for 2010. Uh, revealing a 7.8% increase over 2009 energy consumption. At the same time, Brazil's economy grew uh, approximately 7.5% in 2010 over 2009, its quickest pace in more than a decade, uh, while tens of millions of Brazilians uh, have shed, shed poverty and joined uh, the middle class. Amid a rapidly growing industrial economy, an exploding middle class, and Brazil's emergence as a formidable player in global politics, uh, the demand for increased energy production in Brazil becomes a matter of considerable domestic and international political interest. <clears throat> We're fortunate enough tonight to have Norman Gall with us uh, to enrich our understanding of the politics of oil and energy in Brazil. Mr. Gall has been researching and reporting on Latin America since 1961. His articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, The Economist, the New York Review of Books, The New Republic, Le Monde, Esprit, Daisit, O Estado de Sao Paulo, uh, and the list goes on and on. Uh, in 2010, Mr. Gall was honored with the Maria Moores Cabot Prize from the Columbia University School of Journalism. He has served as consultant to the Exxon Corporation, the World Bank, and the United Nations, was a Guggenheim Fellow, and twice visiting fellow at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Since 1987, Mr. Gall has been the executive director of the Fernand Braudel Institute of World Economics in Sao Paulo, and editor of the Braudel Papers, uh, examples of which uh, you can find in the back of the room. Uh, in his post at the Braudel Institute, Norman Gall has come to personify uh, the Institute's efforts to develop human capital in Brazil and throughout Latin America. This evening's Latin American Briefing Series is co-sponsored by the Program on the Global Environment in the Center for International Studies, the Latin American Business Group in the Booth School of Business, and the Harris Energy Association and the Harris School for Public Policy. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Norman Gall. Well, thank you, Josh, for your welcome, for the Center for Latin American Studies for inviting me here and I'm honored by this invitation. I'm honored by your presence here. There was a, I don't know if any of you folks remember William McNeil, the great historian of the University of Chicago. Sometimes great historians disappear. Um, uh, Bill McNeil is probably the, and Fernand Braudel are the two great historians of the, tw uh, of world historians of the 20th century. And McNeil is a member of our institute. And he told, me one, he told me once that he was invited to give an endowed lecture at um, Cambridge University, and five people showed up. So I'm very grateful that you've come out in such great numbers. Um, the 25 years since the end of the two decades of military rule in Brazil in 1985, and since 1985, been, has been called the best phase in Brazil's history. With the consolidation of democracy, the stopping of chronic inflation, and major gains in social justice, Brazil holds the world record for consecutive months. It's sort of like Joe DiMaggio's consecutive hitting streak, but in a negative, in a negative sense, Brazil holds the world's record for inflation above 20% a month uh, for nearly three years. And you can imagine, and has been 
had two episodes of chronic inflation in 1990 and 1994 before the inflation has, uh, before the, the economy has been stabilized. So these are big achievements. These 25 years coincide with what may be a climax in human development that accelerated during the six decades after World War II. Prodigious advances occurred on a planetary scale in, in longevity, nutrition, productivity, communications, logistics, science, public health, scholarship, and many other fields of endeavor. Middle class patterns of consumption have been proliferating throughout the world. The challenge today is to sustain these advances. Democracy, stability, and rising consumptions gave Brazilians a benign view of their prospects. The Global Attitude Survey of the Pew Research Center in Washington last year found that, that Brazilians are more satisfied with their economic conditions than the, city, than, than the citizens of any of 22 countries surveyed except the Chinese. Some 77% of Brazilians think Brazil will become or already is a world power, although that concept remains very vague. Brazil indeed may be a special case. Visiting Brazil in, Brasilia in 1976, Takeo Fukuda, soon to become prime minister of Japan, told his hosts, and I quote, after the oil crisis, it has become clear that resources are limited. This is a big event in the history of mankind. Your country is a power in the 21st century, a resources power. This kind of talk became woven into protocol in other countries' diplomacy with Brazil. We heard this talk with President uh, Obama's visit to Brazil earlier this month. Yet the talk is coming true. Brazil's cornucopia of resources has come to life as, as booming commodity exports, iron ore, soybeans, beef. Brazil has the world's, by far the world's largest cattle herd. Poultry, cellulose, and many others, in which Brazil is a world leader. Guided by Embrapa, the Government Agricultural Research Institute, application of new techniques transformed the rolling Cerrado Plains of Brazil's central plateau, an area the size of the Great Plains of the United States into the, one of the world's most productive farming regions. It's, uh, it's impressive. I mean, the, the, uh, there's one story. The merchant truckers began developing these plains in the state of Goiás in the 1930s and 40s. They would take their trucks out, to, uh, out from Sao Paulo to buy rice from farmers and then bring it back to sell. There was, in the 1950s, a man who ran, ran a small slaughterhouse in one of the small towns in Goiás. Goiás is the state neighboring Brasilia. It's part of the region, the fastest growing region, which is called the Central West, which includes Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, and Rondônia. The, uh, the owner of this little slaughterhouse became, uh, last year, the, uh, at least his sons became the owners of the world's largest meat processing company, JBS, which bought out Pilgrim's Progress in the United States and with help of government, Brazilian government loans. And uh, a number of things have been happening in Goiás. And sun, uh, last Sunday, there was a uh, article in, in the Estado de Sao Paulo where they said that the uh, that in Goiás, they're start, they're, you know, the Honda, Hyundai is starting an automobile plant. Um, Pfizer is starting the world, uh, one of the world's largest uh, 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 generic medicines plants. And things are really happening. So this is, uh, I mean, this is important. The yet the richest resource may be water. Brazil is endowed with 13% of the world's fresh water supply. A Beijing member, a based member of our institute, Arthur Kriber, uh, editor of the China 
Economic Quarterly said at one of our seminars last month that the biggest limitation on China's development is the lack of water. He added that China hopes to import water from Brazil in the form of agricultural products. Meanwhile, Brazil will have to overcome looming shortages of water, of water supplies for its own cities, because thanks, thanks to mismanagement and a lack of public investment. The idea of Brazil as a resources power was reinforced by a new frontier in petroleum discovery among the last of uh, such frontiers in the world. In 2006, Petrobras, the state-controlled oil company, and its private partners were drilling 7,000 meters below the surface of the South Atlantic, penetrating ancient sediments that lie be beneath beds of salt more than 2,000 meters thick uh, to find the fossil fossilized remains of green microbes that lived 130 million years ago when dinosaurs still roamed the con Brazil's continental interior. Trapped between massive salt structures, these microbe fossils were transformed by heat, pressure, and time into a su the super, super giant field of 2P since renamed Lula, for guess, no, in, in, for, guess no, for guess who. One of the world's biggest oil and gas discoveries of recent decades, and all 10 discoveries of 10 giant fields have been announced so far in the deep waters of the Santos Basin. Brazil is now the biggest market for goods and services in the, in the offshore oil industry and Petrobras the biggest buyer. Some analysts say that Brazil may spend $1 trillion in coming years in capital and operating costs of deep water projects, a sum equal to half of Brazil's GDP for 2010, in by far the biggest industrial undertaking in Brazil's history. Petrobras's annual capital spending for the current decade, which is programmed uh, at, at more than $45 billion is much more in constant dollars uh, than NASA's yearly budget in the 1960s when the United States was preparing to send a man to the moon. Actually, the, Petro, the president of Petrobras announced this week that they're not spending $45 billion, they're spending $56 billion uh, this year which is almost twice what NASA was spending on, on the moonshot. Petrobras's five-year $224 billion investment program is the biggest in the oil industry today, generating 10% of Brazil's total capital investment. The petroleum industry always has been risky, both physically and financially but less so when companies can achieve vertical integration, controlling the flow of production, transportation, refining, and marketing. John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust achieved integration in the early years of the industry, as did the majors, Exxon, Shell, Chevron, and a few others, until the open OPEC revolution of the 1970s greatly reduced their control of reserves. Since its creation in 1954 as an incarnation of nationalist fervor, Petrobras developed spectacularly. With its offshore discoveries since the 1970s, Petrobras stands alone as the world's most highly integrated major oil company, dominating its large national market with government support and with privileged access to huge reserves in the deep waters of the Campos and Santos basins. Yet in, yet in deep waters, it must, still must overcome daunting problems of geology, technology, logistics, safety, finance, politics, human resources, corporate governments, and the strategies of economic development that still must be solved as grasp, Brazil grasps the opportunities of a new era. 
within the limits of this talk, and the limits are very strict. From uh, I can focus only on a few key, key aspects of this very complex subject. And so in what follows, I will touch upon politics, geology, logistics, industrial supplies, and finance, and not least human resources, manpower, which is the gravest of these problems. Politics. President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva called these discoveries a billete premiado, a winning lottery ticket. The pre-salt euphoria bred in the political class, the illusion of limitless resources on the horizon proposing legislation to create new in, a new, new institutional framework governing these discoveries, Lula's cabinet ministers say they promise, quote, extremely low exploration risks and great profitability, end quote. Lula's successor as president, Dilma Rousseff, supervised drafting of the new legal framework while chairing the Petrobras governing board before entering the 2010 election campaign. Furious congressional debate on the new uh, institutional regime focused almost entirely on distribution of royalties among states and municipalities, neglecting the government governance and technical issues posed by deep water exploration and production. As a uh, to give themselves a bonus while they were go going through these hated discussions, uh, the congressmen gave themselves a 62% pay rise, where they now earn $204,000 a year. They are the, among the world's most highly paid legislators. In her inaugural address as president, Dilma called the pre-salt discoveries our passport to the future, <coughs> but warned against the, quote, hasty spending that reserves for the future, only debt, debts and desperation. Unquote. Nevertheless, the new production sharing regime fortifies a politically protected state capitalism with broad discretionary powers and little transparency. A reinforced Petrobras monopoly would reduce chances for competition and, spreading, and for spreading risk among several companies. The new law, uh, laws oblige Petrobras to become the operator with a 30% share, minimum share of all exploration blocks in strategic deep water areas, which means 149,000 square kilometers offshore. It's a vast area, an obligation that would overburden Petrobras's already stretched manpower, financial and technical capabilities. All operation, operating decisions, including the contracting of personnel, suppliers and service providers would be subject to veto by political appointees in a new state company, PetroSal Petroleum, created to supervise these ventures. Geology. The salt beds in the Santos Basin are very thick, in some places reaching 5,000 meters. They are plastic, mobile, heterogeneous, containing different kinds of salt shifting position as drilling proceeds. They cover geological formations with petroleum potential that stretch far into the South Atlantic at even greater depths. These formations would not only would not be accessible today without recent developments in seismic probes and the processing of seismic data. Drilling into the pre-salt uh, reservoir of all of those challenges, the creep, salt creeping is the most common and difficult to manage, the Petrobras uh, geologists say. The salt beds are unstable and can engulf the drill built bit and collapse the casing that, enclose, that encloses the drill pipe. The oil emerges from the reservoir very hot and it goes into a very cold, a cold environment of around, around four degrees centigrade and it congeals and becomes wax to clog the pipe unless they use special chemicals and, 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 and the pipe is continuously lubricated. These are the engineering problems of production. The instability of salt beds impedes high horizontal gr drilling to increase the recovery from s reservoirs immediately below the salt. These are just one of the problems that they face. Now let's talk about engineering and logistics. 
in the pre-salt discoveries, we have two kinds of logistical problems. I, uh, uh, the president of Petrobras uh, told me in an interview I did with him about a year ago, the first is about people, which is a problem of distance. In the Campus Basin, uh, Petrobras flies 60,000 people every month to and from the platforms by helicopter at a distance of about 150 kilometers or less. Now they're 300 kilometers away, and they can't, they can't fly people directly in helicopters. So what they're doing is, is creating hubs in the distance, because we're talking, about, we're talking about distances of 300 kilometers. This is far beyond the logistical capacity of any, organiza uh, any organization. Now, only Shell in the, in, the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico has a platform called Perdido, which is as far, uh, far offshore as, as the Petrobras discoveries. Uh, so they have to reduce the number of people working on the platforms by intensifying automation. We, they have to build offshore platforms midway between the coast and the pre-salt discoveries to serve as logistical hubs with sleeping quarters so that workers arriving aboard boats can be distributed by helicopter to the operating rigs and platforms after overnight stays uh, on the logistical hub. The second logistical problem is the delivery of supplies to offshore operations. You need, tra you need to transport chemicals, machines, electricity. We probably have to, spe we have specialized platforms dedicated to generating electricity and others to mix chemicals for drilling fluids. One of the difficulties of these kind of logistical hubs is creating enough stability. They had thought very considered very, of using old aircraft carriers to, you know, as, as logistical hubs to be able to, as staging, as staging platform. But they discovered that you can't do this with aircraft carriers because, because when aircraft carriers are not in motion, they become very unstable. They swerve from side to side. It's very hard to dock a helicopter or a boat to be able to, to unload, uh, unload equipment and unload people. The Petrobras strategy would automate all operations where possible, reducing the number of workers at sea. In the Santos Basin, bases for the large fleets of helicopters and support ships should change the ecology of the seashore with the port city of Santos becoming a new managerial hub for offshore development. Petrobras's director of exploration and production said they need 50 platform harvesting the initial discoveries. This is just the first couple of, uh, of, of, of reservoirs that they found, not the other eight that they've since discovered. Uh, each, each of these platforms, they 50 platforms consuming each 100 megawatts of electricity, totaling 5,000 megawatts of capacity generated by 200 gas fuel turbines, equal to the, consump the electricity consumption of Greater Sao Paulo, a metropolis of roughly 20 million inhabitants. Supplies. As of 2009, Petrobras dominated the, world, dominated the world market for deep water floating production systems. In the jargon, they're called flo uh, F FPSOs or floating. These are, these are uh, converted super tankers that receive, store, and off offload oil and gas from the seabed. Petrobras operates 23 of the 49 such converted super tankers operating worldwide. That's nearly, that's nearly half of all of the, flo uh, of the, of the FSP, F FPSOs operating worldwide, along, uh, along with 10 of the 17 super uh, semi-submersible production platforms being used in the world. By 2020, Petrobras would absorb 58 more drilling rigs, costing about $600 million each, uh, 45 more production platforms, and, three, and more than 300 super tankers and support ships. Over the next few years, Petrobras is expected to order 300 
630 turbine generators, 610,000 valves, 10,000 kilometers of subsea electrical cables, or called umbilicals, 17,000 kilometers of flexible tubing called risers, 4.8 million tons of steel, thousands of pieces of complex subsea equipment. All of this would involve 68 million man hours of engineering and a billion hours of construction and assembly labor. Gabrielli, the, the president of Petrobras, warned of critical areas of strangulation in the supplies plant, uh, chain. One of them is drilling rigs. A rig takes three or four months to drill, to drill a well through 2,000 meters of water. A converted super tanker, which becomes the hub of a production system, uses 15 to 20 wells. So with one rig, it takes four years to create a production system. Rigs are critical, and Brazil doesn't produce them yet. They're starting to produce them. They've just started ordering rigs in a, in a, uh, in a shipyard that's been uh, partnered by uh, Samsung, the world leader, leader producing a of, and, and a Brazilian construction, two Brazilian construction companies. We lack subsea systems, tubing to collect the ocean floor to the surface. Today we have the whole world's production capacity contracted, and we need more. We must advance in the area of large turbo compressors, which are floating electricity generators. We are talking about gigantic quantities of equipment. Each system produces from 100,000 to 180,000 barrels a day. So if we're going to meet our production goals by 2020, we need 41 of these systems. Each system costs $3 billion. To operate, each one needs a, an average of five support ships. So we're talk, talking of 200 support ships of different kinds, tugs, uh, anchor, anchor, anchor handlers, fire boats, etc., etc. And if there is a uh, accident like that of the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, your talk, the Deepwater Horizon accident occurred 120 kilometers from shore, and we're talking about 300 kilometers from shore, and the rescue and salvaging operation and emergency operations, the Brazilian Navy does not have the capacity. Nobody has the capacity to deal with this. So we're really in uncharted waters. To meet our goals, we will need many more tankers, each with 1.1 million barrels capacity to transport all of this. Finance. In September of 2010, Petrobras raised $70 billion in new capital, the largest stock flotation in world financial history. Of this, 45 billion was government money, including a 16 billion billion dollars from the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the, and the Government Development Bank, the BNDS, raising the federal stake in Petrobras from 40 percent to 48 percent. As part of this circular transaction, uh, in Portuguese they call it a ciranda financiera. The finance ministry borrowed $30 billion, or eight, uh, 30 billion reais, or $18 billion, to lend to BNDS, the, the development bank, so BNDS could buy Petrobras stock. The $45 billion re returned to the Treasury to pay for explorations rights ceded to Petrobras for pre salt blocks supposedly containing 5 billion barrels of recoverable oil near the first discoveries, based on, esti based on estimates. On the, based on the drilling of, of just one uh, exploration well. Some analysts say that Petrobras may have to raise even more capital in a few years. Uh, the biggest problem is human resources. Petrobras, uh, Brazil is straining to find skilled people. It, there are... Um, Perhaps João Almino, the, the Brazilian consul, can explain a little bit about the movement of, of skilled workers to Brazil and the people getting work visas. 
uh, the uh, you know the, Brazil has been a, become a magnet for skilled talent, especially people who have difficulty finding jobs in Europe and the United States. Um, uh, the president of Brest, Petrobras told me that they are, they are in the process of a training program to train 230,000 people to do basic tasks like welding or becoming in, a draftsman. Not for Petrobras itself, but for their suppliers because the skills shortage is so desperate. Most major Brazilian com companies have their internal universities. Uh, Petrobras has a, uh, a Petrobras University that has a throughput of 70,000 people a year to train, to, to give advanced training to their, to their employees and to train new employees. Can Petrobras achieve all this? Politicians, managers, and technicians face these risks with a courage bordering, bordering on temerity. The pre-salt discoveries have developed myths of their own. These myths of unlimited resources hide disturbing questions. Does Brazil really need to invest pre -salt de in pre-salt development at this speed and scale? Will these accelerated investment create distortions of their own? Are these investments in oil more important to the future of Brazil than, to, uh, than investment to correct the enormous deficiencies in public ed education, ports, airports, electricity generation tr and transmission, communications, and the basic sanitation and transportation infrastructure? And all of this is on top of the $80 billion that they're expected to spend on the World Cup in 2004 and the Olympics in 2016, plus many other projects. We can discuss these in more detail later in the question period. Brazil's deep water oil resources are a major target in the worldwide search for new reserves. Petrobras may have to move more slowly and cautiously in overcoming limitations in financial, technical and manpower capacity. These efforts are being undertaken in an environment blessed until recently by low inflation and by economic growth last year of 7.5% of GDP. When Lula took office in 2003, he had the wisdom to recognize that the Brazilian people would not accept a return to chronic inflation. Uh, you probably don't know what it is like to live in a situation of high inflation of over 20% a month when poor people cannot uh, have, a, have a paycheck which erodes during the month and they don't have enough money to buy basic food and grocery uh, at the end of the month and to pay their bills. But now Brazil may face a subprime crisis of its own. Lula's popularity was based on a huge consumption boom, contributing to his 80% approval ratings as he left office on January 1st. The consumption boom was fueled by big increases in government employment and salaries, as well as a tripling of transfer payments, including the Bolsa Familia program that pays small monthly sums to mothers to keep their children in school. The transfer payments and a big increase in formal employment contributed to the lifting of some 29 million Brazilians out of poverty. These Brazilians are offer, enjoying the fast growth of consumer credit to buy domestic appliances, computers, motorcycles, cars, and new homes, with personal loans growing by 26% yearly since 2003 at interest rates exceeding 40% a year that now absorb more than 20% of monthly income of indebted families. Let me tell you a story about the enormous changes that have taken place in Brazil to these people. I, about 20 years ago, there was a big cholera epidemic in Latin America. It started in Peru. And I've done a lot of work in Peru, and I, uh, I did a study of the cholera epidemic, and I did 
some research into public health problems. And I came across an extraordinary report uh, by some Brazilian public health specialists who roamed this back country of Brazil in, two, in, 19, in 1912. On March 18, 1912, a small coastal steam, steamboat left Rio de Janeiro carrying a team of public health specialists on, the, on, the, on a voyage of exploration in, uh, into the expanses of Brazil's drought-stricken northeast. After 18 days on horseback, cross, <clears throat> crossing the thick spiny bush of the Caatinga, the travelers reached the town of San Raimundo Nonato, in the state of Piauí, where two of the researchers, Arthur Neva and Belisario Pena, appraised the human condition. And I'm quoting, rare was the individual who knew, who knew that Brazil exists. Piauí was one country, Pernambuco another, and so with other states. Government for these pariahs is a man far away who gives orders. The existence of government is known because the man sends his agents each year to collect taxes. When we ask if these people, if these lands, POE, Pernambuco, etc., are linked to each other, forming a nation, they say they don't understand this. To, to them, we were gringos, lordazos, or foreign lords. The illiteracy embraces more than 80% of the people. Life is reduced to raising pigs, chickens, a few scrawny cattle, the vicissitudes of the drought, waiting for rain, and nothing more. After the winter co rains comes malaria. Between the old and new towns of San Raimundo, there is a natural basin that floods during the rains leaving water in stagnant pools. During two or three months of drought as epidemic malaria spreads. The water is detestable, salty, taken from a filthy ditch dug beside the bed of a small stream where people fill their bucket, buckets. Why not dig a well lined with stones and, co and covered and draw the water you, using, using pumps, we ask. It's not worth the trouble, they say. People are used to this, and it does no harm, end quote. I was so moved when I read this report 20 years ago, that last, last year around this time, I visited the town of San Raimundo, Nonato, to, to get a sense of how things have changed. In those earlier days, life expectancy in Brazil at birth was around 30 years, roughly the same as in India, against roughly 75 years of life expectancy today. In 1900, Brazil's population was only 17 million, against nearly 200 million today. So modern times have come to Brazil. By appearances, modernization has even reached the Sirt town. A, uh, a corruption of the world, desert town, or big desert, coined by the Portuguese settlers in this vast region in the 16th and 17th centuries. The people of the Sertão no, are no longer forsaken by government. Now they are bathed in public transfers, public transfer payments and subsidies. There are modern hotels, paved roads, air conditioning, Wi-Fi internet, many clinics and commercial enterprises. San Raimundo is still poor and isolated geographically, but nearly everyone has a cell phone. I read, a, on, I read, read in, a, in, a, in a blog this week that Brazil, uh, that Brazil now has 205 reg, uh, million registered cell phones, more, th more, more than the entire population. San Ramon is still poor and isolated geographically, but nearly everyone has a cell phone and three times as many mo motorcycles as cars registered, with sales of motos tripling over the past three years. 
the town's mayor, paid, uh, who's a priest, ed, uh, elected on the ticket of Lula's party, who, uh, who was born in this town, tells me that people are alive to opportunity, migrating to cut sugarcane in the plantations of Sao Paulo State and to work as maids and construction sites in Brasilia and Victoria and other cities, bringing back savings so that they can invest in improving the family home and buying the good things of life. Brazilians are hard workers, and they do accept challenges when an opportunity uh, presents itself. Yet back home, there's mass under underemployment, with scores of young men in yellow, in yellow mototaxi t-shirts idling around the plaza of San Raimundo, waiting for customers, and scores of barber shops and beauty salons empty of patrons. Backward areas of Brazil still depend on government jobs, <laughs> not least in towns like San Raimundo, one of thousands of municipios who get no nearly all of their revenue from federal transfers with little effort to collect local taxes. After a decade of stability, public finances in Brazil threatened to burst out of control. Fears of inflation are reviving. Helpless before the laxity in the finance ministry, the central bank seems seeks one more, once more to curb demand by raising real interest rates to the highest levels among major economies, sucking in hot money and making it harder for the government to service its debts. Widening current account payments deficit is aggravated by an overvalued currency distorted by huge inflows of foreign money. This is an old story. Anyone who has lived through the Latin America debt crisis of the 80s in the 70s and the 80s. I mean, I can remember sitting in hotel, room, uh, hotel lobbies in Buenos Aires and hearing bankers tell each other it's all guaranteed by the government. That, uh, that they, you know, they tell the finance minister, we'll credit your account now by $100 million, with $100 million and we'll do the paperwork later. This is the kind of money that's entering into Brazil today. The future will be sh shaped by Brazil's leaders and its people to adapt to new realities. I wish them well. I am a Brazilian myself, but now disturbances appear on the horizon. Thank you very much. Take some questions now? Yeah, that's okay. So we can, we have time for some questions. Fire away. So who's making the money? And so who, uh, where does Brazil go in all the infrastructure, the, the platforms, the, the, the boats, all that? Um, that's a good question. I don't know how they're going to pay for it. I mean, it, it's... it's uh, uh, Petrobras has, produces oil, it has, it's a profitable company, but how profitable it is, and uh, <clears throat> that's a big question. It's a very simple question, it's a very good question, but I don't have the answer. I, I think the question was where are the suppliers, is that what you meant? No, who, who is actually making money? Who's making money? Who's making money? Right, so who's... So I mean, who's making money in the oil industry or in, in, in or in generally? Generally speaking, in particular, on, on the infrastructure, what do you mean? Like, is it Brazilian companies that are buying all the supplies? No, no, ma ma mainly, I mean, the, 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 the world oil equipment business and services business is an oligopoly. I mean, you have Schlumberger, Halliburton, and a few others, which are setting up their operations in Brazil. These are high-tech companies. Uh, in, men, in most, uh, there's a, an important report by, uh, done for the Brazilian uh, uh, civilian oil industry uh, by Booz and Company. They say that about a handful of companies in these critical equipment and services, like drilling mud, uh, seismics, uh, uh, 
high-tech oil field supplies and services, it's dominated generally by four, five, six companies that have about 90% of the business. And these, I mean, in terms of who is moving money in the oil business, it's these companies. They, they, they buy up uh, Brazilian companies and they set up business themselves. GE is one of them. It's a huge market. Um, in terms of who is making money in Brazil, it's, uh, I mean, people are making money. There's a real estate boom in Brazil. There's a banking boom in Brazil. The financial industry is, is usually, people are making enormous amount of money. Of course, as usual, the most talented economists go into the financial sector. And uh, this is, I mean, I, I'm oversimplifying, but these are the two big areas where people earn a lot of money. Yes? Well, it may burst, actually, it may burst this year or next year. But, but there's a critical difference. I mean, in so far, I mean, central bank, I mean, the Brazilian central bank is more alert than was the Fed. And they are not securitizing these credits. And they're not, they're not creating derivatives out of these credits. So far, there have been inklings of this, but uh, th this has not been detected on a large scale. And I think that uh, Brazil had its great banking crisis in 1995, and they've really restructured the rules and improved bank supervision. So hopefully, <clears throat> this will not spread like a cancer as it has done in the United States. I mean, poor people will go broke, then people will decide, as, like, as in the foreclosure problem in the United States, where bankers don't find it, banks don't find it worthwhile to foreclose on people because they don't want to have responsibility for a deteriorating and vandalized home. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is something that, that, that has not been worked out yet. But I think that, that so far, it is between the bank or the, or the, uh, or the vendor and the customer. And does not, it does not look at this point as if it will impact the financial system. What did happen in the, in the 1980s during the escalation of chronic inflation, uh, they froze payments. They, f they froze payments on mortgages when, uh, and, you know, the nominal payments on mortgages when uh, inflation was running at 100% a year. So basically, they had a national housing bank which granted these mortgages, and, and the bank, the housing bank went broke. They went, you know, it, it disappeared, and they're still working out the who owes who owes what to whom with the, with, with the debts accrued by the bank. But this is this this could happen. But this, uh, but in terms of the entire financial system, it probably at this point, as far as I understand it, will not be like in the United States. Yes. Um, what is your view on uh, the Brazilian tax system, where they where Brazil has one of the highest, uh, where the Brazilian worker uh, spends uh, a, a, a really long time of his, of his year just to pay his taxes? And in though and though the Brazilian economy, had, uh, the Brazilian government does have a lot of services, it's nowhere near the European welfare system, uh, uh, at least not to that scale. But the Brazilian worker pays almost, if not more, very comparable in, in terms of taxes. What is your view on that, and should it be lowered? Do you think lowering it would create, would make the economy better for the workers? Would it have backlashes? I don't know. Well, I mean, the thing, uh, uh, Brazil is at where perhaps the European, Brazil pays about 12% of GDP on pensions for a young population. 
uh, for it has a, an enormous deficit for public employee pensions, which are which are which is worse than the deficit. You have not about ninety nine hundred thousand public employees who are receiving retired public employees are receiving pensions, and maybe something like fifty million people. Uh, from the private sector receiving pensions, and the deficit of public sector workers in the pension system is much greater than in the uh, uh, than the private sector. I mean, you know, Brazil has acquired huge debts. Brazil, in its uh, social welfare system, which is about 25 percent of GDP, uh, they had about the same level of European uh, European countries, which also spend. Uh, 25% of GDP on uh, on, so, uh, on transfer payments, but in Europe, it is done. It is managed to level income inequalities, while in, in Brazil, uh, it, it basically subsidies for the middle class. And so uh, this is changing, with the transfers under Lula and under the previous government of Fernando Henrique, they've been able to reduce the the. The in, uh, reduce in, income inequalities. The tax system is very complicated. Um, there is car another one more effort now uh, to revise the tax system. The new president, who is uh, a very intelligent woman who is handling herself very well, uh, is, has decided that she will try and do this by step by step because it's very hard, as in the United States, to reform the tax system. Uh, the SAC system is um, is uh, what what they call regressive, rather than distributive, and so uh, you know the, the but there are a lot there are, there are very important interests at stake to maintain maintain it that way. Uh, would you Would you speak louder, please? Yes, sorry. Uh, the subprime crisis. What, what, what did you mean by this? That it could be. The... Poor people are in debt, and they can't pay their. They, they won't be able to pay their debts. No, I, I mean, but you're saying that something similar to what in the states happened, because if you look at mortgages uh, compared to the GDP in, in, in Brazil, they're still between five to ten percent, and then in the states. You know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, either my. my uh, if you can move closer and just. I mean, I want to hear your question so I can answer it. I would say that uh, here in the States, when the crisis happened, uh, mortgages over GDP ratio were above 100%, and then in Brazil, they're still between 5 to 10%, and still a very low ratio. Um, how could something like a bubble be happening in Brazil? Um, because it's growing very fast. And uh, it's growing very fast, and in certain income levels, I'm not talking, I, we're, 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 I'm, tr I'm talking mainly about consumer credit, not about mortgages. I mean, if there is a subprime, if there's a subprime problem in Brazil, it's in consumer credit, not in, in mortgages, which is another story and which can be discussed separately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I enjoyed very much the presentation. It's very important to at this moment to raise this kind of question that you're raising about the, uh, about the result, basically. Uh, but let me just, first of all, make a, a small comment about the so-called bubble. Because uh, indeed, as the gentleman has just said, uh, when the crisis hit the US and Europe, in Brazil, uh, the, in fact, the percentage was even lower. It was 2% of the, of the financing was allocated to, 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 to mortgages. To, to mortgages uh, and also, there is also the, the difference from the point of view of uh, the regulatory system in Brazil. Because, uh, uh, for example, the, the, the level of deposits in the central bank. The level of? The, le the level of deposits yeah. of the banking system in the central bank in Brazil mm -hmm. are still now very, very high. They are more than double what is required by the Basel uh, yeah. agreements. And, and so the, there is a very strict regulatory system in Brazil. The, the private banking system, very sound. Mm -hmm. So in fact, the, uh, we cannot actually anticipate 
a bowl in the, in the housing market. That used, as you said, that could be a risk for uh, maybe other kinds of financing. I was talking mainly about consumer credit. But I, I would like to ask you two questions, basically, in relation to, to your presentation. Uh, one is, uh, I think you, you raised the right question by asking, well, shall we uh, do things at this speed, or what, what kind of speed uh, should happen in terms of investments uh, in the of Brazil? And I think, uh, if I understood you correctly, the question had to do with the alternatives that uh, there are in the country in terms of investment. Shall we not be investing in health and education instead? That was, I think, one of our questions. But, you know, I have read also uh, many people saying this, and in fact, it's in the law itself that created the result. That the expectation is that the result will generate uh, a very high level of profits. In that, part of the investment in health and education should come from the, the result of this investment in the result. But this that is part of the rationale. And uh, the law itself that was approved, uh, I think, requires that a certain amount, a certain percentage of this, should be allocated to a a fund, so-called social fund, yeah. uh, that would then invest in, 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 in health and education. So I wanted to comment on this, you know, to see if you, if you think this is indeed something that, uh, you know, that we, we should expect that would happen. Uh, now, the other, the other comment that I would make is, uh, or the other question that I have for you is, in relation to your final comment that had to do with the high inflow of capital in the zone. Uh, I mean, the uncontrolled inflow. In fact, just in January of this year, uh, there was a higher inflow of capital in the zone than the whole of last year. So this should be really something of concern. So what do you think about the very latest measures that were adopted just in the last few uh, of taxing uh, some of these inflows of taxes. Well, I mean, I think, you know, as, um, as politicians would say, I'm glad you asked that question. The, um, uh, I, um, uh, Dilma, the president, gave a very important interview two weeks ago in the newspaper Valor. It covered two pages in which she said that you know, she would not tele tolerate an increase of inflation. On the other hand, she would say that uh, the problem is not in demand, the problem is in supply. And if you are familiar with the history of chronic inflation in Latin America, this is the kind of things that the Argentines were saying in the 80s, that Alan Garcia in Peru was saying in the 80s, and in other words, when you're saying that the problem is supply and not demand, then you're 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 advocating throwing more money at problems, and this this and this will make things even worse. Um, the she has uh, apparently at the insistence of Lula, she has maintained a very weak finance minister, who has ins uh, who has insisted on maintaining public spending at very high levels. Public spending increased by 16% last year. Uh, and there is a uh, $40 billion budgetary cut. Uh, no, but, the, but uh, I can show you, uh, Juan. We have a member of our institute who has done, uh, who works for the Brazilian Senate, as a matter of fact, Marcos Mendes, who has done a monograph, which I can send you. Send you. The, you know, what, what they're talking about, a $50 billion uh, real budget cut. <clears throat> this is not from what was spent last year, but what is in the what was in the budget for this year. So that they're plan they were planning an increase in the in public spending for this year, and but this this public spending is not yet real. What what they need is to cut from last year, and they are not cutting from last year. They're increasing spending this year. 
And there's actually, you know, because of the rigidity of the Brazilian constitution and, and, and spending laws, they really cannot, there's very little room for cutting spending. This has been the problem of a series of, of finance ministers that because the, uh, Brazil is a highly indexed economy. And so a lot of and pensions and salaries and, uh, and electricity rates and many other things are indexed, to, uh, are, are indexed to inflation. Next year, they had a big battle this year over the minimum wage, which is very important which is related to pension payments. And the World Bank called pensions Brazil's worst fiscal problem. And because of the formula that they adapted with, between Lula and the unions, uh, there will be a 13% increase in the minimum wage last year, uh, next year, which will be passed on to pensions. And there's no way of, 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 uh, of dealing with this without having a, front, uh, a major confrontation with the unions. And there's little, the, 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 I mean, the government now will have to keep its word. So there are major inflationary pressures building in the, building in the economy. And uh, the, uh, and the, the, the central bank seems to be accepting this. They have reduced the, uh, the inflation targets. I mean, they, they have eliminated the inflation or expanded the inflation. They've said this yesterday that they will not be meeting the inflation targets this year. They'll be doing it for, for uh, they'll do it for 2012. Not the middle of the target, but still within the... Yeah, yeah. But basi basically, th th that was their target. And so this is... Um, uh, Dilma has shown, to, shown herself to be a very skillful politician, much more than many people expected. She has won uh, a great deal of support, but she faces very difficult problems, both in her own party, in the Congress, and uh, uh, we don't know how, the, I mean, it's imp I mean, if she has conflict over these things, she will be in direct conflict with Lula, who is her benefactor and who pro promoted her, re her election. There would be no chance of, being, of her being elected without, without Lula parading her around the country. And uh, this, uh, so she's in a tough spot. And we don't, and, and, I mean, and she has not, she has not uh, contract, she has not uh, put in place senior cabinet people who have, uh, people of high ability who can really handle these problems. There are no, there are no, the, 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 the and and the, the, the Conservative Party, which is now called the Dems, uh, or, the, or the Democratic Party, these uh, is breaking up. They are, uh, there's a major fight among these leaders. And really, there's no coherent political opposition in Brazil. And this is tragic, because the PSDB, uh, Fernando Henrique's party, really represents something in Brazil. It represents a middle class who uh, wants to establish civilized values of, of public conduct, they have um, they have a constituency, but they're a bunch of prima donnas who don't do the uh, the hard work of, of political organizing and establishing a political base. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, I would just like to ask a further question. Do you see um, imaginary longer as I can't. I can't hear you. Uh, do you see Nevis as uh, True well, I mean, he's a member of the PSDB. He has been flirting with leaving. Aesio Neves is the, the grandson of Tancredo Neves, who was elected the first civilian president by the Congress in 1985, and who, uh, who was a very skillful politician, and who unfortunately took sick and died on the eve of his inauguration. And that ended, that started a, a uh, a, uh, a, a, a series of events which nobody expected and nobody really wanted, where they had uh, a, a, one of the feudal political bosses from the Northeast, who was his, who was his compromised vice president, uh, took office, and who is now still the president of the Senate. And uh, this, 
this is one of Brazil's uh, compromises, but Aesio is a, uh, is a leader. He's, a, he's an authentic leader. He's done a good government in, in Minas. Uh, we don't know what, I mean, he is flirting with several, uh, several political factions. And I, I think he is a representative of, of the PSDB, whether he will win. I mean, there have been so many fights among these people that you don't know who will, uh, who will win out and whether Aisi will stay within the party. There have been many rumors, newspaper stories for two years now that he would be leaving the party. Yes. Uh, my name is Yura. Uh, from, your, from your talk, it seems that uh, the rest discovery of oil uh, has focused again all the public and private investment. I, I, I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. Uh, from, from, your, from your talk? I'm an old man, sometimes my... <laughs> It seems that the, the recent discovery of oil has, has focused again on the public and private investment, uh, just in the oil sector, right? So what about, what, what's the relationship with another source of energy that have been developed in, in Brazil, like ethanol or clean tech? They, they have been um, taken, uh, displaced by, by oil, or what, what, what's the relationship with this, with this other? Well, this other investment well, I mean, in this long interview that uh, the Dilma, I mean, you know, the people, you folks who, who, who read Portuguese should really read that interview. It's two full pages two weeks ago in the, uh, in, the Valor, in the newspaper Valor Economico. It was really one of the great, I think it's one of the great newspapers of the world. It's, it's, it's certainly in the quality of the Financial Times of London, and uh, they did a two full page interview with her. And she said she wants Brazil to, um, to export the oil and use clean energy at home. And whether this is possible with the automobile market growing at the rate it's growing is another question. But this is her, this is her, this is her publicly stated aim. They want to do nuclear power. They want to do. They they want to expand hydroelectric power. The level of disorganization in the hydroelectric sector. There were two major uprisings last week and the week before. They're building two giant dams in the Mazera River, which is a tributary, one of the major tributaries of the Amazon, and they have collected almost overnight some fifty thousand workers. From, from the poor regions of Brazil, they've transported, they, these, these people rioted because of inadequate transportation, inadequate housing. These are construction companies who have, may have something like 50 years of experience building dams. But the rush to build these dams, and also they're building them without adequate provision for, for electricity transmission. And you're talking about direct, uh, direct current electricity transmission over from the Amazon about 2,000 miles to, to, the, to, to, the, to the consumption markets. So these are big problems. Brazil is richly endowed with hydroelectric resources, but the engineering, the organization is, uh, is in, uh, uh, you know, they, they, Brazil has had enormous resources, but they've had major blackouts in recent years. I think one of the, I don't know if I gave that, uh, one of our Bradell papers is called Blackouts in Energy Policy, where, where they built the, 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 the industry is in the hands of the construction company. They basically plan and sell to the government major hydroelectric projects, but the government does not build transmission lines. And there are harebrained schemes. There's one, they're building, they're building, they're supposed to be spending something like $18 billion on a dam in the Amazon uh, called Belo, Mo Belo Monte, where they will not have a, uh, because of environmental disputes, they will not have a large reservoir for the dam. So, be because it would, it would flood an enormous area, there are, pro there are problems with Indian tribes and other, uh, and other. so they, they are reducing the size of the reservoir. That means the, this huge dam will only be able to produce its capacity for six months of the year. And they haven't, they haven't, <clears throat> they haven't built or, or, or designed uh, tran electricity transmission. The the design, the idea is to send the the electricity 
to Manaus, which is a city on the major city on the Amazon River, that would mean I'd have to cut transmission lines throughout the uh, through the Amazon forest, which in itself would create enormous controversies. And and even if they did build the transmission lines, then you would have the problem of maintaining them, because it's extremely difficult to maintain transmission lines in the middle of the jungle, where the jungle is always coming back. And you're doing this over a period, over a stretch of maybe 1,500 kilometers. So these are very big problems. Uh, I, I think that a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the, the, the dam building in Brazil has fallen into the hands, and this is since the time of the military government, where in the hands of the construction companies, which they basically want to sell projects in which they can make money on. And, and so far it has been uh, to Brazil's benefit, but the thing is becoming very disorganized. Uh, you, somebody else had a question back there? Yeah. Yeah, how, how do you see the pace of infrastructure projects ahead of the World Cup in the Olympics? Pardon? How do you see the pace of infrastructure projects in the cities ahead of- In cities? Yeah, ahead of the World Cup in the Olympics. Well, I mean, Pelé, are, everybody knows who Pelé is. Uh, Pelé uh, gave an interview. He, he said he expects a, dis uh, the, you know, a disaster in the World Cup because they're not making preparations. The, the uh, FIFA, the world uh, governing body of football, has, has, has protested to the Brazilian government for the lack of preparation. So, I mean, this is, this is an open story. I don't know. I mean, it's not, it's not too, I mean, Brazil had a lot of, has a lot of stadiums. The airports are terrible. But, you know, they will accommodate traffic. And uh, I don't know how it's going to play out. Yes? I'll just follow up on that. Um, I was actually just in Brazil talking about a couple of infrastructure firms. Um, a couple have pointed out, e even worse than the airport non-privatization issue, still run by the military, is a lack of hotel capacity. When you suddenly try to have 50,000 people come in for a, a football game in away from Sao Paulo, Rio, uh, they, don't have, they don't have the capacity that uh, maybe the world would be okay, but the, the, you don't have the hotel. And for political reasons, they're spreading the World Cup into several cities. I mean, if it was just Rio, Sao Paulo, and one or two other cities, it would be okay. But, but basically, they're going to be flooding, they're, they're going to be flooding, uh, uh, flooding these cities with people who are there basically for one or two nights. And you can't build ca hotel capacity for people who are going to stay just one or two nights. I mean, you know, really, uh, let, let me just say, Brazil is a wonderful country. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm enormous. Uh, Brazil has been very generous to me. I have been, uh, it's a very exciting country. Uh, I'm, I've become a Brazilian citizen. And, uh, but as you can get from my talk and from my answer, there are problems. And uh, it's better to face these problems than to, you know, th than to wave the flag. Yes? Yeah, just going back to the issue of oil profits, uh, there was another country in South America that had a very ambitious plan for oil exploration, and that was Venezuela, and they're not doing so well. Um, do you think the Venezuela experience offers any lessons for Brazil? You know, I lived in Venezuela for six years. My two children were born there. Um, the, uh, I left back there some uh, essays called All in Democracy in Venezuela, which will probably say a lot more than I can say here. But, but uh, I mean, I think, the, Venez I think the, uh, the Brazilians are terrorized, are terribly afraid of what could happen in Venezuela or, 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 or what happened in Venezuela or in Nigeria or Angola. Uh, in countries where oil has just brought more disorder and more poverty for the population. So this is, this is something uh, very much on the minds of the people in, in, who are running Petrobras and are running the government. Are we done? We have time for uh, one, one uh, more question. Just a brief comment uh, uh, in relation to energy. I think it's good to remind, you know, despite of all the problems and you, you mentioned some of the hydroelectric uh, sector as well, that still one good thing that, that, uh, that happened in Brazil 
is that the energy matrix is basically clean yeah. up to now. And uh, for example, if you take just the OECD uh, matrix uh, in energy, you'll see that only 6% of the energy in the OECD matrix are renewable energy. In Brazil, what is the percentage of that? I think it's about 50% right now. So it's really a, a big difference. And I think this uh, uh, puts, puts it into context maybe some of these comments in relation to energy. And uh, of course, this will be a big challenge to see if the, with the pre salt investment, this will continue to be true. Mm -hmm. And that's why maybe the, the observation made by the president makes sense. I mean, we, of course, to, to, for this to continue happening, we would need to be exporting more than using the, the, the oil. That you, know, you know, I had a funny experience on the plane coming up here. I mean, just this, this in support of what you've been, you, what you've been saying. I mean, I mean, things ha extraordinary things happen in Brazil. I was sitting next to a fat man who, uh, who was always moving, and I sort of, the unfortunate, fortunately the plane was not full, so I f moved into another seat next to a man who was sleeping. And when he awoke, he told me that he was a, a soybean oil trader for Cargill. And he told me that, uh, in 2005, Brazil produced virtually zero in, bio, uh, in biodiesel made out of soybean oil. And now it, it supplies 50% of the truck, 5% uh, of all diesel used in the, in, the, in, the, in the country's truck fleet. It's been growing and the government set a, uh, set a price, uh, uh, above, an above market price, as they did when they started developing ethanol in the 70s. And it just, and it just took off. And these kind of things happen in Brazil, and they're very positive. Some of these policies, despite all the things I, I, I've been saying, or some of the things I've been are some of these policies are very wise and creative. But there is a lack of consistency in some key areas. And the most desperate area is uh, is education, and uh, the political leadership cannot get, uh, is not motivated to deal with the problems of education, which is why Brazil has such uh, severe skilled manpower problems. And this Petrobras training program of 200,000, 30,000 people, what they have to do with their recruits is teach them how to read and write so that they can read a manual or read instructions before they can, they can enter serious training. And this, this is a terrible problem in the country. And the political class has just not faced this problem. And the political leadership has not faced this problem. I mean, Lula said, well, he had a fifth grade education. He became, uh, uh, he became president with a fifth grade education in a rural school or in a school in, uh, in, in, the, in the suburbs of Sao Paulo. So why do you need an education? This is... Uh, uh, he finally, in the second term, he began to wake up to the problem. But it, it requires a consistent level, uh, effort, not only, not only in the national government, but in the state and local governments. Uh, in Brazilian education, private, uh, primary education, the first eight grades or the first five grades are largely in the hands of municipalities. Secondary education is in the hands of the states. So you have to have a lot, a wide spectrum of political authority involved in the education problem, and this is not happening. It is beginning to happen. People are now vocally worried about this. Business people are worried about this. Um, but very often they don't know what to do. I mean, our institute is working, I mean, one of the major activity of our institute is working on education and to try and find solutions. But it's very hard, it's very hard and uh, they're now at least they're talking the talk, now they have to walk the walk. Thank you. <laughs>